as we prepare to be reminded of how good God is to us and all that he has done. So let's sing out together.
to sing songs like that where we are reminding ourselves of the things that we actually know to be true, the things that your word has told us we need to believe, we ought to believe, and we say often with our mouths that that is in fact what it is that we believe, but then we turn and chase after other things. We put things that were never meant to be in your place in place of you. And so I pray this morning as we as we spend time remembering what it is that you've done, the way that you have uh, empowered your people to live in holiness, to live in obedience to you, uh, the way that you have fulfilled your promise to come and rescue your people. God, we pray this morning that that would cause our hearts to change, that we would not find satisfaction in the things that this world has to offer, but that we would find it in you, that we would not try to find salvation in things, in relationships, in power, 
but that we would find them in you. Because as we've been reminded time and time again, there is no one, no name under heaven by which we can be saved except for that of Jesus. So write that on our hearts, burn it into our minds, God, we pray. In your son's name. I was an orphan lost at the fall Running away when I'd hear you call Father, you worked your will well, I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne But Father, you loved me still and in love before you laid the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone This is the, uh, the first Sunday of Advent when we set aside time to be reminded of the, the waiting that was done for God to come through with his promise uh, to save his people. And we know, we know that that has happened in the past. We know that Jesus came. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. But we also recognize the fact that we are still living in this strange kind of already not yet this in-between time where we are waiting for Jesus to return and to make everything right again. So as we come together at Advent, that's what we do. We remember the waiting and the longing that we have for things to be the way that God created them to be. And the hope 
and knowledge that that is going to be the way that it is going to be. But until we get there, we come together and we remember. Uh, and churches have been doing this for so many, so many years. And so we light a candle after we read a passage of scripture. Today's passage comes from the book of Isaiah. So I'm going to read this and then we're going to sing one more song together. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, his government and its peace will never end. And let's read this together. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. So we trust him to be true to his promises. And we wait together in expectation of what he'll do. So let's sing this together. Well, come. Thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel's strength and consolation. I mentioned in the earlier service, Angel, I've got these slides in the wrong order and did not fix them between gatherings. So we're going to sing the verse that starts out with Born Thy People to Deliver. Sing this out. Well, born Thy People to church that is called to be the hands and feet of God, to be his, part of his kingdom here on earth. Why don't we take the next little bit and welcome each other here, extend a handshake, show some love to one another this morning. Hi everyone, my name is Jason Roberts and I'm the director of Wagner Hills Farm Society. Wagner Hills is a safe, beautiful place that provides healing, growth, and transformation for people on the road to recovery. We've been doing this work for 40 years and we have seen thousands of lives come through our doors. I'm one of those lives. I checked in here 25 years ago. Like so many others, I got broken and I didn't know how to deal with the pain until I found my escape. I was a heroin addict looking for a way out of life and I thank God I came through these doors. 
People ask, what is the transformational work? Like, what do you do on that farm? Basically, we see lives transformed through formational teaching. That is classes, guest speakers, chapel and group session. We see transformed lives through work. We are a working farm, so we roll up our sleeves and get into the dirt. We see lives transformed through personal counseling and personal plans. And we see lives transformed through meaningful community inside and outside of our farms. Full days of transformative work. It's much more than just getting sober. It's setting people up to build a new life. Thank you all for helping us, for being a partner in this work. Feel free to visit us here on site anytime. Well, good morning to you. Uh, great to be here this morning. Uh, that little video is a brief introduction to the ministry that uh, happens at uh, Wagner Farms. And uh, every December as a church, uh, we participate together in a Christmas giving project. We raise funds in addition to, you know, what you give towards the ministry here at Crossridge. We want to be partnering with uh, other ministries who are doing gospel work. And this year, we've chosen to partner with Wagner Farms. Uh, Wagner Farms, as was mentioned, is a working farm that's out uh, in Langley. There's two locations. Uh, it's an addiction recovery center, but it's really so much more than that. I got introduced to that ministry uh, over the last couple of years, uh, really first through a golf tournament. And then I had the chance uh, this summer to go and visit uh, Wagner Farms to take in one of their chapels and to get a tour of the farm. Um, I got to know one of the, the residents, one of the graduates from that program, and uh, really was just struck by the significant impact that they are having. Uh, and uh, you can actually go this Friday. There is a chapel that is happening at 11 o'clock at their uh, Langley site, uh, and then there's a lunch to follow. So they said, you're invited to come if you want to come and learn a little bit more about the ministry and the farm there. Uh, you're welcome to do that. But they will be here next week. Uh, Jason, who was on the video there, and another fellow by the name of Jack is going to be here. I, I got to tell you, I, I uh, met with Jack, heard his testimony, and just wept at the grace of God and how lives are transformed. So we are going to be partnering with them. They are seeking to raise funds. Uh, they're in the middle of a, a project to raise funds to house uh, 50 men uh, on their site. And they have someone who is graciously offered to match whatever donations come in the month of December. So we as a church uh, are going to be doing this as a giving project. More details about the specifics, how you can give to that next week. But for now, I just wanted to highlight it for you that this is what we're doing uh, as our giving project this year. It's going to be uh, great and great to have it local so we can partner not just with our money, but actually with our presence as well. Um, one other thing we want to pray for as we think about kind of being focused on mission, uh, and that is we have a group that is headed to uh, Mexico this week uh, for a uh, building project, a work project there. There are six individuals from our church who are uh, part of that team. Are any of them here in this second gathering? Yeah, a couple of you, you guys just want to stand. Florin, Dave at the back. Is Travis here at all? Travis, who's leading the team, is not here. Uh, but these guys, uh, along with uh, John Funk, Neil Curry, Travis Wims, and one other from our church who are going. Anyway, <laughs> I'd say not important for you to know, but it is. You want to pray? For Roland, of course, Roland was here in the first. Uh, why don't we just pray for these guys as they head out for uh, a week of, of ministry in Mexico. Father, we thank you for the different opportunities you give us to be uh, part of um, actively trying to... Um, advance the, the cause of the gospel, and we do it in different ways. We do it as we were talking about through ministries like Wagner Hills. We do it through ministries like this, where we can go with some practical skills and labor and bless the church in different parts of the world. And I pray for this crew as they go, that it's a great time in their lives, that it's also a blessing to the church. And, uh, and we just pray for you to oversee all the details, the, the travel details, safety, and uh, the, the physical building of stuff. And we want to commit it to you, and we just pray for us as a church, we would continue to be um, about building uh, your mission and uh, committing ourselves to it. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you got a Bible with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open it to Acts chapter 4. We're continuing our study in the book of Acts and uh, the events 
that we read about in Acts chapter 4 happened, of course, on the heels of what we read in chapter 3. And the significant event in chapter 3 was the healing of a man who was uh, a lame man, healed by Peter and John. And uh, that event, what took place in chapter 3, the healing of this lame man and their subsequent preaching about it, the sign and the sermon led to the very first instance of opposition and persecution directed towards the church. Now, we saw last week that Peter and John spent a night in prison as a direct result of their preaching about the resurrection of Jesus. Today, we're looking not so much about what happened to them, but we're looking at their response in the face of the opposition they faced. So we're going to read the passage. We're in Acts 4. We're looking at verses 13 to 22 this morning. This is God's word, and this is what it says to us. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Well, someone once said that a Christian is a lot like a tea bag. Uh, you don't really know what you've got until you add some hot water. And I know that's a, a bit of a cliche, but that is kind of what we see in this passage. Peter and John find themselves in hot water. And we get to see what is produced when that hot water is added. Now, if we were to describe their response in a single word, I think the word boldness would be the right word. Verse 13 begins by saying, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, Uh, that word boldness is used once in these verses. It's going to be used two more times in the verses we're going to look at next week, and then several more times through these early chapters in the book of Acts. But even in this chapter, verse 29 gives us the content of their prayer after they were released. And it says this, and now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Uh, Verse 31 then describes their activity like this. It says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, before we get into the specific insights from these verses, I just want to briefly say something about boldness or courage or fortitude. Courage is and ought to be one of the defining marks of a Christian. The very first thing that struck these men as they interrogated Peter and John was their boldness. In the midst of a hostile context, They unabashedly spoke about Jesus, and they unashamedly spoke about sin. That kind of boldness, that kind of courage is in short supply today. I was encouraged by a couple of G.K. Chesterton quotes regarding courage. He said this, courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live, taking the form of a readiness to die. Now, that is the kind of courage, the kind of boldness that Peter and John showed here. They were well aware that the religious leaders who were interrogating them, interrogating them at that moment 
were the same ones who had decreed that Jesus ought to be crucified. But they spoke anyway. Chesterton went on to say this about courage. He said, he that will lose his life, the same shall save it, is not a piece of mysticism for saints and heroes. It is a piece of everyday advice for sailors or mountaineers. It might be printed in an alpine guide or a drill book. A man cut off by the sea may save his life if he will risk it on the precipice. He can only get away from death by continually stepping within an inch of it. A soldier surrounded by enemies, if he is to cut his way out, needs to con combine a strong desire for living with a strange carelessness about dying. He must not merely cling to life, for then he will be a coward and will not escape. He must not merely wait for death, for then he will be a suicide and will not escape. He must seek his life in a spirit of furious indifference to it. He must desire life like water and yet drink death like wine. That is the kind of courage that is in short supply today. And the reason I am laying stress on this, the reason I'm saying we need desperately this kind of courage is because the world has changed. You know, there was a time not that many years ago when declaring yourself to be a Christian might have even meant, you know, some applause from the world around you. Lots of people would have concluded from that, oh, you must be a person of strong moral character. You must have good values. You're someone we can trust. Now, maybe they would have thought, you know, you're, you're, you're a little bit prudish or maybe a little bit judgmental, but that's about as far as the criticism would have gone. Today, Declaring your Christian faith might be a conversation stopper. In lots of contexts, the, the, the person might immediately conclude, well, that must mean you're repressive, you're bigoted, you're misogynistic, you're homophobic. And because of that kind of pressure, we can easily withdraw to just a private faith, right? This is just between me and God. I don't want to jeopardize any relationships. I don't want to jeopardize any, you know, possible contracts or promotions, and so we take our light and we just hide it away. Now, just to clarify, when I talk about boldness and courage, I'm not talking about going and looking for a fight. When you read through the sermons in the book of Acts, you will find there is a consistent combination of bridge building and boldness. So you can see it in Acts chapter 19. Paul goes into the city of Ephesus, and when he preaches there, he does that very thing. He, he builds some bridges with the people, and he also preaches about Jesus boldly. You can see it in Acts 22, when Paul is in Jerusalem, and what he does is he builds some bridges with the people, and he also preaches about Jesus boldly. Now, I'm focusing on the courage or the boldness part today because that's what we see in this passage before us. So as we make our way through this passage, I want to direct your attentions to three truths that we discover here. The first one is that impact doesn't come from pedigree or position, but from proximity to Jesus. So look again at verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So Peter and John stand in the middle of this group of religious experts, and they astound them. It says when they finished speaking, the group interrogating them was astonished. Now, the group they were standing for was the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the Jewish ruling council. It was made up of 71 men, sort of the best and the brightest of religious leaders and scholars. They went to the best rabbinical schools. They had letters behind their names. These guys were a big deal. And part of the reason they were astonished is because Peter and John were fishermen they were uneducated, common men. How is it that these simpletons possess such clear understanding and boldness? And the religious leaders made the mistake that we often make. 
We size people up on the basis of their appearance or on the basis of their pedigree or their position. You know, there was a, a video from ranking that went viral back in 2021 and then again a couple of weeks ago. That's when it showed up on my feed and I found it fascinating. The video is about what happens when a group of strangers tries to rank each other's intelligence based on external factors. The video has, you know, 8 million views, so there's a chance maybe you've seen it. But there are six people in this video, and they take turns introducing themselves. They state their name, they state their level of education, they state what their current employment situation is. And then they take turns ranking each other's level of intelligence based on what they've seen and heard. You know, you're number one or you're number six. And there are some seemingly smart people in the group. Five of the six are university graduates. One of them graduated from Yale and works in finance. Another one graduated from Harvard who works in consulting. One of the six is a 30-year-old woman with a PhD who works in biotech. Now, she's the smuggest one of the bunch. I mean, you, you can tell. She probably thinks she's always the smartest person in the room. And then there was also a 21-year-old high school graduate who works for the Marine Corps. The five university graduates all ranked the 21-year-old Marine Corps guy at the bottom of the pile, right? I mean, he's definitely going to be the least intelligent because of his age and because he's in the Army. I mean, who, who makes that as a career choice, right? Can't be that smart. Then and they didn't know this was going to happen, they take an IQ test. The PhD lady comes in with a score of 112. Number six. The Marine kid gets a score of 131, not first place, but only five points behind the Harvard graduate. And that video reveals lots of things. Actually, the comments are so entertaining, that's just a side note, but anyway. <laughs> One of the things it reveals is the way people mistakenly associate intelligence with education level. This is what I mean by saying that our impact doesn't come from pedigree or position. Peter and John were uneducated, ordinary, common men. Now, uneducated doesn't mean illiterate. It means unlettered. They didn't have the formal training of these religious elites. But when these religious leaders encounter them in Acts chapter 4, it says they couldn't refute anything they had to say. But notice what else they observed. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So what does that mean exactly? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Well, it, it could just mean that they recognized them as having been with Jesus in the same way that the servant girl recognized that Peter had been with Jesus when she saw him in the courtyard after Jesus was arrested. You, many of you know that story, right? It's when Peter denies Jesus. So in Matthew 26, we read, now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. So maybe it just means that, but I don't think so. I think it means something far more profound. And we might be helped by going back to what Mark tells us about the way Jesus called his first disciples. Listen to this verse from Mark chapter 3. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. So where did Peter and John learn what they learned 
about the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Messiah? Well, they learned it from having been with Jesus. Where did they develop the courage to face opposition head on with calmness and grace? They learned it from having been with Jesus. And I would just say this is what is always true of Jesus' followers. The impression we make is not based on our human credentials. Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church when he said, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. He knows how to encourage a guy, right? But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. That's who we are. Not many of us are of noble birth. Not many of us are wise according to worldly standards. Now, I don't want to over-spiritualize this, but there, is in some, but there is something important for us to learn from what we read here in Acts 4. I mean, there are some people when, you know, you spend time with them, you can't help but come away from a meeting or time like that and think, man, that's a person who knows Jesus. I mean, they, they have a living relationship with him. There's just some people that radiate the grace and love of Jesus. They might not have a seminary degree. They might not have any formal Bible training, but they know his word and they live by it. It comes out in their conversation. It comes out in their interactions with other people. You, you look at them and say, man, they've been with Jesus. Now, I know we usually pray at the beginning of a sermon or at the end of a sermon, but I, I, I want to stop mid-sermon, and just pray for us as a church that this would be true of us. So let's pray. Lord, we do pray that the thing that would be most evident about us as your followers is not our pedigree, not our level of education, not our social status or standing, but that we've been with you that the thing that defines our life is we know you and love you and know we're loved by you. We pray that would be true. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Now, remember the context here, right? The context is opposition. So what are we supposed to look like when facing opposition? What does faith under fire look like? What happens when hot water gets added to our lives. There's a couple of verses in the New Testament that I think highlight what it's supposed to look like. In the book of Titus, we read this. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent might be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. How do you silence the opponents? Well, you demonstrate you've been with Jesus. Maybe even more directly, Peter himself would later write this. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Our greatest impact in this world will not come because of our pedigree, or because of our position, it will come because of our proximity to Jesus, our relationship with him. Second thing we learn here is that belief is not ultimately about seeing or hearing, but a matter of the heart. And this is what we see in verses 14 to 17. Those verses say, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, 
and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. The summary of those verses is that they could not deny it, but they would not acknowledge it. Now, I've stated this in terms of belief, not ultimately being about seeing or hearing. And I put it that way because we're all familiar with the expression, seeing is believing. And we all get that. I mean, we, we're not just going to believe something because someone says it. We need some evidence for ourselves. That is not a, bo- a bad posture to have. But notice that actually wasn't the posture of these religious leaders. Their posture was, look, we're not going to believe this even when there is compelling evidence standing in front of us. I mean, they see the formerly lame man standing before them. Everyone knows this guy. He's been begging at the gate of the temple for years, for his whole life. He's 40 years old. They say it can't be denied that a notable sign was performed among them, but they can't acknowledge it. Why not? Because it will mean admitting that they were wrong about Jesus and they are not prepared to do that. And what I'm trying to get at here is that the root cause of unbelief is often something other than a lack of evidence. Now, Jesus was a master at exposing this kind of thing in people. There's a short passage in Matthew chapter 11 where we can see his brilliance as a teacher on full display. And there we read this. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John, this John the Baptist, came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Jesus captures the fickle nature of people with a short proverb. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. On the surface of it, that proverb simply demonstrates that some people are impossible to please. And you know exactly the kind of people I'm talking about, right? I mean, all winter long, they complain it's too cold. And when summer comes... They immediately complain it's too hot. Some people are impossible to please. They can find a dark cloud in every silver lining. Jesus describes children who are like that in these verses. The scene that Jesus describes here is one that children of any generation could relate to. Jesus says, look, these people are like children playing in the marketplace. Now, in the ancient world, you would go to the marketplace every day. You'd go either to to buy something or to sell something, and you'd often bring your children along with you. The parents then are busy shopping, and the kids are bored. Does Does that sound familiar to anyone? Now, in Jesus' description, there's two groups of kids, right? One group is playing. They're inviting the others to come and join them in their games. They get out the flute, and they say, hey, let's play the wedding game. But those sitting on the curbside say, no, that's a stupid game. It's it's too silly. I'm not going to play that game. So the children change their tactic. They go into their bin of dress-up clothes. They say, well, you know what? Let's play the funeral game. But this time, the kids on the sidelines say, no, that's a stupid game. It's too serious. We're not playing. Jesus says, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, Jesus is saying something really profound here. He understands the human heart really well, which means he understands our propensity to deceive ourselves. And I would flesh this out by saying that if you're looking for a reason not to believe, you can always find one. So why did the people reject the message of John the Baptist and Jesus? Well, on the surface of it, it was because John was too fanatical and Jesus was too loose. But according to what Jesus says here, the real reason people were rejecting Jesus was not because of John or Jesus, but because they didn't want to play any game but their own. 
See, that's the reason underneath the reason. Now, if you could have gone to those children in the marketplace and you were to ask them, hey, why aren't you joining in the game? They probably would have had an answer. Well, the reason I don't want to play the wedding game is because I'm not in a happy mood. Or the reason I don't want to play the funeral game is because I'm in a good mood and I don't want to play a downer game. I don't want to dance and I don't want to mourn. And they would be answering in a way that they thought was truthful. But those of you who have kids or have had kids, you know that the reasons kids give for not participating in a thing doesn't really get you to the core of the issue, right? I mean, you're 10 years old. You invite Sally over to play. She's as bored as you are, but you, you, as you try to figure out what to do, you, you suggest all these things. She doesn't want to do any of it because she has her own ideas about what she wants to do. I've watched that scene play out many times. What's really going on has nothing to do with this game or that game. What's really going on is who gets to be in control. So why didn't the people respond to John's message the way they should? Was it because he was too harsh? No, it wasn't. Why didn't the people respond to Jesus' message? Was it because he was too soft? No, it wasn't. You can always find a reason not to believe. And when you're trying to find a reason, any reason will do. That's what these guys do here, right? They have clear evidence standing before them in the person of this man who was formerly lame. They knew him. They knew he'd been healed. But they still would not believe. And I've talked with lots of individuals who've taken that same tact The reason I don't believe is because the Bible is filled with contradictions. I've got a Bible here. Show me where the contradictions are. Well, look, I'm not an expert in those things. I just know they're there. But I've got all these other reasons why I don't believe. This past summer, I read a book simply titled The Intellectuals. And the book basically features a a portrait of a number of people from history that we would consider to be towering intellectuals. These are individuals who've had a significant impact on modern thinking. Portraits of people like Karl Marx and Bertrand Russell and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And what the book does a really good job with is showing the connection between a person's worldview and their behavior. Now, we might all think, well, that's obvious. I mean, you behave in accordance with what you believe. That's not necessarily the way it works. What was true of lots of these individuals was that their behavior came first and their philosophy was developed as a way to justify it. It often works like that. You know, one example of this from history is Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley was considered one of the leading intellectuals of his day. He was the author of the dystopian novel, Brave New World. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize in literature seven different times. In the 1920s, Huxley argued that we needed to get rid of religion because it was too emotional. He argued we should instead concentrate on science and reason. That's where we will find the real answers to life's problems. Now, Aldous Huxley died in 1963. He died the same day as C.S. Lewis and John F. Kennedy. But in the 1960s, Aldous Huxley was no, no longer saying science and reason were the place to find answers to life's riddles and questions. He actually looked at the state of the world, concluded science and reason have made a mess of this whole thing. Now he was saying we need to get rid of Christianity because it's too rational. He was now saying... Or advocating what we need is mysticism. We need emotionalism. He he actually died while on an LSD trip. If you are looking for a reason not to believe, you can always find one. And that describes these religious leaders to a T. They could not deny what had happened, but they would not acknowledge it. Belief is not ultimately about seeing or hearing. It's a matter of the heart. Final thing we discover here is that the fear of man enslaves us 
but the fear of God empowers us. Now, last week we looked at the fact that, at least on the surface of it, the, the, the leaders or the authorities had all the power. The deck was stacked in their favor, right? They had the experts, they had the numbers, they had the authority to do with Peter and John whatever they wanted to do. And we noted some reasons why it wasn't actually the case that they had the authority, but, but there's one reason here in these verses that we didn't talk about last week. Now, remember, the authorities are still not happy that Peter and John are going about teaching the people about Jesus. They still want that shut down. And so they tell them, look, you're not allowed to speak in this name any longer. And we'll we'll get to what Peter and John say. But notice then what happens in verse 21. Verse 21 says, And when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people for all were praising God for what had happened. That little phrase right in the middle of verse 21 is interesting. It says they couldn't do what they wanted to do because of the people. See, they wanted to either keep Peter and John in prison or have them publicly flogged, but they couldn't because of the people. And this is something you see with lots of people in positions of leadership. It doesn't matter what their convictions might be. It doesn't matter what course of action they would like to take. They are paralyzed by the opinions of others. If the majority is in line with them, they'll do it. But they don't want to do anything that might jeopardize their standing in the court of public opinion. That's the fear of man. And that will enslave you. There's no freedom in that. Now, I talked about courage earlier, and I would just say that you will never have courage if your behavior is dictated by the fear of man. And if we're ever going to grow in courage, it means we have to care more about what God thinks of us than what others might think about us. Note the contrast between the authorities and Peter and John and who was free. Listen to verses 18 to 20 again. It says, So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Now, we're going to get into the issue of the proper relationship to human authorities when we get to chapter 5, because there we're going to read this. We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you fill Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So for now, let me just say that God ought to be the supreme authority in our lives. And look at what happens when that's the case. These lowly, undistinguished, unlettered fishermen stand before the leading authorities in Israel and say, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. That's the kind of boldness and courage that we need. That's the kind of boldness that can only come when we care more about what God thinks of us then we care what others think of us. And testifying to what we have seen and heard is what we're called to do. I mean, this is what Jesus commissioned us to do. Remember at the very beginning of this series, I told you, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 is the key verse in the book of Acts. And there Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. That's our calling. Now, I think we make all sorts of excuses for why we don't fulfill that calling. Why we don't seek to share the gospel with others. Well, look, I'm not a natural evangelist. I'm not sure that I can answer all the questions a person might have. You know, I'm just waiting for the right opportunity. And by that, we mean someone saying, you know, hey, how do I become a Christian? But I wonder if the biggest reason is simply that we care too much about what other people might think about us. You know, there's a tradition among sports fans of, certain teams that I actually think is is quite funny. When the team you cheer for is really bad, 
Like, you know, you've been a lifelong Cleveland Browns fan or something. I know they're better this year, but, but in general, that's been the sense with that team. Sometimes they'll pan the crowd with the camera, and what you'll see is you'll see people sitting in the stands, but they've got a paper bag over their face, right? With little <laughs> cutouts. And the idea is, look, I, I still want to cheer for this team, but I'm too ashamed to admit it. I think there are lots of paper bag Christians out there. I mean, the bag comes off when you go to church, but you pretty much wear it the rest of the week. I mean, you just want to be completely anonymous about this whole thing. And the reason you do that is because you're enslaved by the fear of man. You care far too much about what others might think and not nearly enough about what God might think. And I would just say, this is not a trivial matter. Christian courage is not sort of an optional extra for the super spiritual. Jesus said it this way. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. In a similar way, the book of Revelation describes those who lack Christian courage with these words. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, as we read a list like that, I mean, it almost seems like, you know, one of these things is not like the other. I mean, cowardly is connected with murderers and sexually immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and liars. But this is a serious issue that we either name the name of Christ or we run and hide from it. And I think we're called to this kind of courage, the kind of courage we see in Peter and John, the kind of witness that declares Jesus is the way to salvation. So let's pray to be strengthened in that courage. Lord, we do pray that by your spirit you would strengthen us, that we would find our greatest joy not in the applause of man, but in hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant from you. Lord, we pray that we would be people who have been so marked by your grace that when people encounter us and see us, even if there might be some hesitancy, some opposition, they would say, well, I I cannot deny this is a person transformed by the grace and love of Jesus. Jesus. And God, we pray by by your power, we will become those kinds of people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to celebrate uh, communion together this morning. And as we do that, I want to read for you uh, just a few verses. Uh, Verses I don't think we often read at communion, but uh, I was reflecting on them and just thinking, I think it's a fitting reminder of the gospel and it's the fact that it is good news. And Titus chapter 3. Uh, we find these verses. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated and hating, or sorry, hated by others and hating one another. And then it says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That is the gospel message. It's that we were far from God, but when the kindness and goodness of God our Savior appeared, and that means appeared in the person of Jesus He saved us, not because of our righteousness, but because of his righteousness. That's what we celebrate at communion, that we have a relationship with God because of what Jesus has done for us, because of his perfection and his sacrifice on our behalf. So if you are a guest with us, we invite you to participate with us. If Jesus is your savior, you've trusted in his 
sacrifice for your salvation. Uh, We come forward, we take the bread that represents the body of Jesus given as a sacrifice. We take the cup that represents his blood shed for our forgiveness. And then we take it back to our seats and we will all participate together. Uh, There is gluten-free option down on this side. Yeah, and let's stand together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name. Thank you.
In Matthew's Gospel, we, we read this. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Let's do that in remembrance of him. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's do that together.
Well, it's been a great morning together. Uh, just two quick announcements for you as you head out. One is to let you know there's a lot happening in and around this place today. Uh, there is a movie that we are showing here at 3 o'clock. It is The Grinch. You can invite others to attend that. There'll be some community folks attending as well. Be a great time. Immediately following that is a parade that happens down our street. It's a great family event. To say it's a great parade. It's, it's kind of like Macy's except bigger, right? It's, um, <laughs> but it's happening out here. Lots of people come and line the streets. Uh, it's great for us to have a presence here. There are, in connection with that, there are some Christmas Eve invitations that we like to make use of at events like that, hand out to people. Uh, love to have you help us with that. But then also, um, we would just encourage you to take some of those Christmas Eve invites and invite someone to join us here on Christmas Eve. And for your information, we have three Christmas Eve services, 10 o'clock, so there's a morning option, and then 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, sort of the more you know candlelight style of things. It'll be the same exact service, same sermon, so you don't need to come twice unless you want to come and hear it twice, um, but you can. But anyway, 10, 3, and 5 on Christmas Eve, love for you to be part of that. As you go, just as your benediction today, I read you earlier some verses from Titus. That the closing verse in Titus just says, grace be with you all. That's my benediction for you today. Have a great week.